Well, hey, welcome everybody. It's great to be here with you. My name's Chad. I am one of the pastors here at Shelter Cove. This past week for me has been a whirlwind of a week. It has been a week to remember. So last Sunday, literally like seven days ago, I, I was here at church and got a phone call at about 940. And my wife was like, honey, my contractions are about three, four minutes apart. We need to go to the hospital. So I booked it out of here and, and took her over to the hospital. And at 526 p.m. last Sunday, we welcomed our second child into the family. Um, so it's been a wild week. Uh, I got a picture of her right here. This is McLean Noel. It's a little girl. I know. Man, she's cute. Takes after her mom. Uh, that's one of the easiest ways to win over an audience. You just show them a picture of your kid and, and uh, you got them. But uh, this is our little girl. And I just wanted to thank you guys. I wanted to thank all of you for your love and your support and uh, for shooting us text messages, reaching out on, on social media. Most importantly, though, thank you for bringing us food. Seriously. Um, I, I just love eating food. And, and if we could keep this arrangement for like six or seven months, I would be totally on board. I have no problem receiving that gift from the Lord. So uh, thank you. You guys have made this season of our lives real special, and um, I, I appreciate it. We've got a lot of Bible work to do today. Grab your Bibles, John chapter 12. Um, John 12 is where we're going to be. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. One of our ushers will come get a Bible to you. Uh, you'll find John 12 in, all, in our hardback black Bibles on page 899. If you've got a Bible on your device, you're more than welcome to use that. Uh, if we catch you playing Candy Crush, we will publicly embarrass you. Um, I'm just playing. We won't. We'll let you be. Um, we want you to see the Word of God today. We want you to have the Scriptures in front of you. We're going to be camping out in John 12 today. As I said, my name's Chad. I'm one of the pastors here. We're in a series right now called Impact Part 2. If you're just jumping into Shelter Cove, welcome. We love that you're dialing in and hanging out with us today. We started Impact Part 1 at the beginning of the year because this is the word for Shelter Cove for the year. We want to see God have an impact in us and then through us. And as we're rapidly approaching into the fall season, even though it's still like 130 out, um, we want to revisit some of these ideas. We want to look again at the scriptures and see what they have to say about how God can have an impact in our lives and through our lives. Last week, Pastor Jeremy gave a stellar message on the impact of leadership. Now, whether you see yourself as a leader or not, the truth is all of us will be influencers. All of us have an influence on people. If you missed his sermon, jump online and grab that sermon. It's one of those lessons you could listen to probably four or five times before you really get the truth of it all into your heart and mind. It's just a rich biblical message last week. Today, we're going to post up in John chapter 12, and we're going to look at an attribute that you and I are absolutely horrible at. We are just terrible at this, selflessness. So with that very encouraging introduction, let's stand and read John chapter 12, and we'll pick it up in verse 20. My translation starts like this. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will what? Honor. The Father will honor him. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you for these men and women here. I want to thank you for these souls, Lord, that you've fashioned and you've created and, and you've made, Lord. You've known about us since the beginning of time, before the foundation of the earth was laid. Lord, Lord you had us in mind. You knew that we'd be right here, right at this moment. You knew that we would hear these words. And I just want to thank you, God, for being so personal and, and just knowing us so closely. And I want to pray now, Lord, that by your spirit, you would help our hearts and minds to be sensitive, to be in tune with what your word is going to say. 
I pray that it would mold and it would shape and it would sand down the rough edges of our hearts, God. And I pray that we'd be more like Jesus. I pray that when we leave here, God, we would be uh, one step closer to being more like your son. I love you, Lord. Thank you for all that you are. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. The first point in our text and in your notes says this. I want you to see the scandalous request that gets made of Jesus. I want you to see this very, very scandalous request that gets laid before Jesus. In verse 20, John records this. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. What verse 20 is retelling for us is Tuesday in Jesus' last earthly week here, his, his last week on, in his earthly life. We have Jesus on Monday entering into the city of Jerusalem. He enters into Jerusalem riding on this little donkey, and thousands of people are worshiping him, and they are hailing him as the Messiah. They're saying, Hosanna, son of David. They're giving him messianic titles. They're saying, the Messiah that we've been waiting for for thousands of years, you're the guy. You're the one. Jesus has done some mind-blowing things up until this point. He's cast out legions of demons. He's raised the dead. He's healed unbelievable scores of people from illnesses, blindness, sicknesses. He has demonstrated an authority in his power, an authority in his teaching that nobody's remotely close to. And now the people are like, you're the guy. You're the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for. Now, this is a fickle crowd because just in a couple of days, they'll be shouting, crucify him. We have no other king but Caesar. And before we start feeling high and mighty like we would never do that, that crowd is us. We are that fickle crowd. We are the ones that change our minds on Jesus like crazy. Tuesday rolls around. Jesus goes up into the temple to worship. And he has in tow with him all of his fellow Greeks, Greek, uh, Jew brother and sisters. They're all coming up with him into the temple because this is not only the Passion Week, the last week of Jesus' life, <clears throat> but it's also the Passover week. What the Jews would do before they celebrated Passover, they had certain meals that they would eat for six days. And they were to, to prepare their food in a certain way, and they would go to the temple and have these big meals together. So Jesus is going up into the temple with all of his Jewish brothers and sisters to have these preliminary meals. And the text records that there's some Greeks that go with him. Now these Greeks were most likely Gentiles that were, were kind of converting to Judaism. They had some Jewish um, religious practices, but they were Gentiles by birth. Now, when they go into the temple, they approach a man named Philip. Philip has a Greek name, even though he's a, Jewish, he's a Jewish man. And he's from a region called Bethsaida. Bethsaida's up on the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. It's a Jewish area, but there's a lot of Greek and Gentile commerce that comes in and out of this city. So these Greeks see this guy who's got a Greek name, and he's from kind of a, a Greek area. And they go, that's our link, that's the bridge. And they go up to Philip and say, we want to see Jesus. The scandalous request, next point in your notes, is that the Greeks want to see Jesus. Now you may be sitting there going, Chad, that doesn't sound so scandalous. What, what's the big deal about that? Jesus talked with tons and tons of people. So what if he wants to sit down and talk with some Greeks? This is scandalous on two levels. Number one, the Greeks aren't just asking to see him, like, like just catch a glimpse. They're not just asking like to take a little selfie with him. They want FaceTime. They want to talk to him. They want to carve out some time with him but on a much deeper, much more profound level. At this point in history, the Jews and the Gentiles, especially the Greeks, hated each other. I mean, absolutely hated each other. Prejudice, despising, disdain, they hated each other on both sides. The Jews hated the Gentiles, partly because they had been persecuted and enslaved by tons of Gentile nations. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Romans, the Assyrians, all of these Gentile nations had at one point subjugated, oppressed, and enslaved the Jewish people. 
The Jewish people had this practice when they would travel into Gentile land. On their way back to Jerusalem, they would shake their clothes off because they didn't want to infect their city with Gentile dust. (laughs) We don't even want your dust in our city. The Jews saw the Gentiles as immoral, pagan, polytheistic, sensuous, self-indulgent, everything that they did not want to be. We see the prophet Jonah. When Jonah preaches to the city of Nineveh, huge Gentile city, and he goes to Nineveh and says, y'all need to repent or God's gonna destroy you. And the city repents. This wicked, vile, horribly savage city repents. And what does Jonah do? He gets all upset about it. See, God, that's why I didn't even want to come out here because I knew you were going to be gracious to these people. This would be like somebody going to San Francisco, preaching the gospel to them. All of San Francisco repents, and they get upset at God. Why? Because he didn't think the Gentiles were worthy of God's favor. We even see this a little bit in Jesus' ministry. When Jesus comes upon the woman at the well, shows up at the woman in the well, and he asks her for a drink, she is a Samaritan. That means half Jew, half Gentile. He says, would you bring me a glass of water? And her response is, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. You don't talk to us. So keep in mind what's happening here. Jesus who's being hailed as the Messiah, the most important Jewish figure ever. I mean, it's the one they've been waiting for, the pinnacle of Judaism, the Messiah. They believe he's here. They're in the temple, the most holy, sacred piece of property on the planet, and they're celebrating, they're getting ready to celebrate the Passover, one of the most important Jewish holidays. And here come these Greeks going, hey, Jesus, we don't want you to talk to these Jews. Come talk to us. How do you think the Jews would have felt if they caught wind of this? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus is our guy. You're in our temple celebrating our holiday. Back off. And you can see that there's some hesitation here. The Greeks approach Philip, and what does Philip do? It says here in verse 22, Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew's another one of the disciples. And just like Philip, he has a Greek name, even though he's a Jew by birth. He has a Greek name. We don't know what they talk about, but what we do know is that they decided to just lay this before Jesus. It very well may have been something like, dude, Andrew, if we, if we tell Jesus about this, the, the Jews might hear and they might flip their lids. They might be ticked. Andrew's like, I don't know. I'm, yeah, probably, but you know what? Jesus has done some crazy stuff, man. Let's just lay it before him. Let's, la- let's ask him and see what he thinks. And that's what they do. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, verse 23, And Jesus answered them. Next point in your notes I want you to look at. I want you to see the scandalous response that Jesus gives to them. There's a scandalous request made, and then Jesus, in vintage fashion, is going to respond in the same fashion. He's going to give them somewhat of a scandalous response. Here's what he says. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Okay, we've got tons of work just with that line right there. The Son of Man is probably one of the heaviest, biggest, like it is like the Mac Daddy of all the messianic titles used in the Bible. It comes from the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. And in Daniel chapter 7, what you have is Daniel prophesying about four great earthly kingdoms, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans, and how these nations are going to rule and reign with very, very strong authority, very might, power, and, and an unbelievable sense of conquering. And then Daniel talks about this anointed one, this son of man. And this son of man is going to rule over the world in a way that the earthly powers never, ever could. So the Jews would look at this and go, that's the Messiah. And what the Messiah is going to do is he's going to elevate Israel to international prominence. He's going to be a Jew. He's going to elevate Israel to a military, economic, and governmental strength that she's never seen before. Israel will finally have strength and might and dominion over all these Gentile nations. And the Messiah will be like King David 
and Superman and Batman, like all mixed together. He's going to be like this incredible leader who can, who can conquer nations and defeat all the armies of the earth. And Jesus just said, the Son of Man is about to be glorified. So they're in the temple with all these Jews around them on the Passover, just before the Passover. How do you think the crowd is feeling? I mean, they're probably like, yes, this is what we've been waiting for. It's about time. Israel's going to be top dog again. Son of man's about to be glorified. Yeah, Jesus, you take your place. You destroy those Gentiles. Elevate Israel to the top. We've been waiting for this for thousands of years. And then Jesus starts talking about wheat. Why on earth does he do this? Vintage Jesus kind of starts playing into people's mindset and then takes a sharp right turn. Here's what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, anytime you see that in the Bible, that means Jesus is about to say something kind of crazy. But it's true. In our natural fleshly self, it's gonna sound ludicrous, but Jesus is saying, hey, trust me. Trust me, I'm telling you the truth. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. <laughs> I can picture Philip and Andrew at this point just being like, Jesus, again, do you want to talk to the Greeks or no, man? Just a yes or no answer. That's all we need. And Jesus is like, son of man, glorified, grain of wheat buried in the ground. Can you just tell us yes or no? But see, Jesus is wise. He's wise beyond all recognition, and he knows what he's saying here is going to reverberate for thousands of years. The next point in your note says this. Jesus is telling the crowd, he's telling them what he's about to do. The Son of Man is about to be glorified. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And the crowd's like, yes, now's the time. And Jesus goes, it's not really going to happen how you think. He uses wheat as his word picture. He's going to paint a picture here. He says, if you think of a, a grain of wheat, if you just leave the grain of wheat by itself, it, it'll be fine. It'll just stay by itself. But nothing will really happen to it. It just kind of sits there idle. If, however, you take that grain of wheat and you bury it into the ground, and the grain of wheat itself starts to break apart and dies in the ground, what will come up out of that is a whole harvest of grain. So what's Jesus doing? He's telling them what he's about to do. He's saying in the same way that that grain of wheat dies and produces a harvest, I'm going to die. I'm going to lay my life down so that I could ransom many. I'm going to lay my life down so that it might be a bountiful harvest of souls that will come into my kingdom. I'm going to be glorified, but it's not really the way that you think. My glory is going to come from laying my life down as a ransom for many. And then Jesus tells, next point in your notes, he tells the crowd what his followers are going to do. He explains to them, here's what my followers will do. And it's here that Jesus starts to address the whole Greek question. It's here that Jesus will start to include the Greeks. Verse 25. Whoever. Not if you're Jewish. Not if you're Greek. Not if you're wealthy or if you're poor. Whoever. Whoever. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus is explaining here, in the same way I'm laying my life down for many, my followers will lay their lives down. Now here's what this passage is not saying. This passage did say that we're supposed to hate our lives. So does that mean Christians should be miserable, depressed, gloomy, just horrible people to be around? No. No course not. This passage is not saying that you should go home, lock yourself in a dark room, and just cry for the rest of your life. That's not what it's saying. I know that for two reasons, because first of all, one of the primary fruits of the Holy Spirit is joy. But I also know 
James says that every good and perfect gift comes from above. It comes from our Father. I'm a dad. I love giving my kids gifts. I love watching their faces light up. Our Father in heaven is eternally better at being a father than I ever will be. He likes to give us good gifts. He likes watching us enjoy good gifts. So what is this passage saying? This passage is trying to ask us a question. Look right at me. Hear me on this. Who are you living for? That's what this passage is trying to dial us into. Who are you living for? You have two choices. You will either live for yourself or you will live for Jesus. Those are your only two choices. Chad, I disagree with you. I live for my family, or I live for my job, or or I live for country and honor. Okay, fine, but you're the one that decided those were the things to live for. You, by your own intellect and by your own sovereign choice, you played the role as sovereign, decided that that's what would be best for you. You still decided to live for you. You just put your affection on something else. You will either live for you or you will live for Jesus. And that's what he's trying to dial us into here. He says, if you hold on to your life, if you love your life, you make it all about you, you will lose it. You'll lose it in this life and you'll lose it in the life to come. But if you make your life about Jesus, you follow in his example, you lay your life down for Jesus, you will find life not only here, but you'll find it in eternity. Jesus says a phrase similar to this in every single gospel, all four of the gospels. He says something similar to this. He says things like, if you hold on to your life, you'll lose it, but if you lose your life for my sake, you'll what? You'll find it. You'll find it. Church, this is the great Christian paradox. This is one of the greatest paradoxes in all of Christianity because it's so counterintuitive to how you and I think. You and I think that we'll find fulfillment by living out and satisfying every craving, every desire, every dream we have. If I can just fulfill every craving, if I can just meet every desire, then I'll be happy. And if anybody stands in my way, then they are trying to oppress me. They're trying to hold me back from true joy. And Jesus says, if you make your life about that, you're dumb. You're not going to find what you're looking for. There's death that way. On the flip side, if you lay your life down, if you follow Jesus' example and give your life up, then you'll find life. I don't know of anybody else in the Bible that demonstrates this better than King Solomon. King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, who, by the way, lived way bigger, way better, way badder than you ever will. He had more money, he had more popularity, he's way smarter than you. If you don't believe me, just read Ecclesiastes. The guy could throw parties for 20,000 people every single day. So your little 20-person backyard barbecue soiree might be cool. Solomon would laugh at you. And Solomon gets to the end of his life. He's made his life all about himself, and you know what he says at the end of his life? It's all vanity. It's all meaningless. None of it works. I made tons and tons of money, Solomon would say, and all I found is that the more money I made, the more I wanted. I never had enough. And then Solomon will go on to say, as I started amassing all this money, do you know who enjoyed the money? Not me. Solomon's like, I didn't enjoy it. It was all the people mooching off me that enjoyed it. I was too busy working and trying to protect my money. And then I I realized that as soon as I die, I'm going to have to turn all this money I slaved over to somebody who didn't work for it, and they're probably going to blow it. It's all vanity. It's a real chipper, cheery book. (laughs) But it's truthful, and it's exactly what Jesus is saying. You make your life all about you, you're going to lose it. You make your life all about Jesus, you're going to find it. It's a paradox. So counterintuitive how we think, but it's true but it's true. Jesus dives into this concept just a little bit deeper. Look at, look at this with me. Verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Jesus just said there that if somebody lays their life down for me, they make their life about me, one of the primary characteristics in their life will be service. They'll be a servant. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. He must be a follower of me. 
We could say it like this. If anyone serves me, if anyone lays his life down for me, he or she will be selfless. They will be growing in an ever-increasing level of selflessness. The rest of their life, they will learn more and more and more how to lay their life down for Jesus, to make more of their soul, more of their life, more of their mind, more of their deeds, more of everything about Jesus. They'll grow in that. And if we're going to have an impact in our city, in this church, we must become selfless. Now, I need to talk about this last part here. And this is a a part of the text that I kind of struggled with. In your notes, the next point says this. Jesus tells the crowd, he tells them what his father's going to do. And I kind of wrestled with this. Let me show you why. Let me show you what it says. This is mind-blowing. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Middle of 26. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor, will honor him. Okay, pop quiz. Where is Jesus at right now? The book of Hebrews, the book of Revelation describes Jesus as being at the right hand of the Father. The right hand is the place of prominence, it's the place of favor. In ancient times, it was almost more valuable to be at the right hand of the throne than to actually be on the throne. And the scriptures say Jesus is at the right hand of the throne. And he said, wherever I am, there will my servants be. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we endure with him, we will reign with him. All throughout the Bible, we're described as co-heirs with Christ. This means all of creation, all of the things that Christ inherits, we inherit with him. We rule and reign alongside with him in eternity. This is crazy. We're going to be at the right hand with Jesus. And then Jesus says here, my father is going to honor those that serve me. Those that lay their life down for me, my father's going to honor them. He's going to call them out by name and recognize them. The Father, the Most High. And I struggled with this because I felt like, man, if, if you serve, you should just serve without any expectation of reward. And, and I think there's a good and right place for that. But as a pastor here, I'll be held accountable for how I teach the Word. And it doesn't seem like Jesus shies away from the fact that, that there's a real blessing here for serving. That those that serve are right alongside Jesus and will be honored and recognized by the Father. That is staggering. And it's how the kingdom works. Jesus said it elsewhere. Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom is going to be who? The servant. If you're first in this world, you'll be last in the next. If you're last in this world, you'll be first in the next. It's a paradox, man. It's backwards. But it's the truth. It's the truth. It's how the kingdom works. The next point in your note says, following Jesus' example is going to be both difficult but also life-giving. What I don't want to do is get up here and pretend. I don't want to do that. What I don't want to do is get up here and pretend like laying our life down is just kind of this like easy thing to do. Because the truth is, it's very, very difficult. It's going to involve you and I saying no to the short-term pleasures, the short-term gratifications that we are so enthralled with. But you want to know the trouble with short-term pleasure? It's short-term. It doesn't last long. I had um, Taco Bell last night, had a beefy potato rito. Man, it tasted good. And then my stomach was jacked up for like two hours afterwards. Is that not how sin works? Oh, man, it's so good going down. And then it's like horrible. You see, Jesus is calling us to lay our lives down to him, to submit to him. It's going to be difficult. It's going to require struggle. It's going to require prayer. It's going to require accountability. 
It's going to require falling a lot and getting back up. But church, look right at me. It is worth it. It is so abundantly worth it. This is what we're made for. We are made to submit and follow Jesus. We are not made to try to do this on our own. We are made to be in joyful submission to Christ. I'm going to bang this drum as long as the Lord will have me bang it up here. I'm going to bang it loud and proud. Here's what I've learned. I have learned that the more I lay my life down for Jesus, the more I submit to the scriptures, the more joy, the more pleasure, the more peace, the more fullness I find in life. Yes, it's difficult. And yes, it means saying no to the short-term temptations that pull on my heart. I have never, ever, ever regretted resisting temptation to follow Jesus. I've always enjoyed that. You know what I regret constantly? Being stupid and giving in to sin. I've never regretted obedience because it always produces joy. It always produces intimacy with God. So I think sometimes what we'll do is trick ourselves. We'll feel like, I just need enough Jesus to be saved, but then I want to go have all that fun. Oh, don't look at me like you don't do it. I do it. I know you do it. My brother and my sister, you're just selling yourself short. No, no, that's not the pathway to pleasure in life. Joy and pleasure in life is found in deeply trusting and deeply obeying and walking close with Jesus. That's where it is. I mean, like, have you read what David says in the Psalms? David says in Psalm 4, you, God, have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. When the food is plentiful and I can drink all the wine I can drink, you're still better. Psalm 16, you make known to me the path of life. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Yes, laying our lives down for Jesus will be difficult, but there's life there. I have never regretted obeying and submitting to Jesus because it always produces joy. Difficult at times, you better believe it. Worth it. It is so worth it. So worth it. I want to close our time with just two questions. The first question says this. What in my life needs to die so that I might live more for Christ? Jesus has explained that he's going to lay his life down for us and that his followers will lay their lives down for him. That we're to be selfless. And Jesus has explained that one of the manifestations of that selflessness is going to be serving. People will serve. They won't be about themselves. They'll be about others. They'll be about Jesus. So what in your life is holding you back from being all in with Jesus? What, what addiction keeps vying for the affection of your heart over Jesus? What relationship do you have that's just not healthy? What idol do you have in your life? Is it work? Is it family? Is it sports? Things that aren't bad in and of themselves, but when we make them ultimate, they become evil. What is keeping your soul back from laying fully down to Jesus. There was this really smart Christian guy named Augustine who said, Lord, give me chastity, just not yet. I sometimes feel like that. Lord, I know this is where I should go, but man, my heart, there's something holding my heart back. My brother, my sister, for your own joy, for the fullness of your life, lay it down. Trust me, the grass is greener with Jesus. It's better. I have a friend that has a shirt, and his shirt just says, bro, Jesus is better. It's true. He's better. He's not the easy route. I'm telling you that right now. He's not the easy route. He is the better route. And the last question here says this. Where can I be a servant at Shelter Cove? Now, I know you're feeling the itch. I know you're feeling that you want to pack up. Go ahead and pack up, because I still got stuff to say. Got me? Okay, cool. Go ahead and pack up. Um, he, here's why I wanted to end with this. Jesus said, if you lay your life down for me, you'll serve. That's one of the manifestations of this. 
It's one of the demonstrations of this. If you're anything like me, what you're probably doing right now is this. You're coming up with all the excuses as to why you can't serve. No, nope, too busy. Sorry, Chad, too busy. That's for the other people. It's for the other people that have no lives. I'm too busy. <laughs> Hear me. I've done church long enough to know that a lot of you really are busy. Some of you like to just say you're busy. You're not. But a lot of you are. Here's what I just want to lovingly say to you. And this comes from a position of love. If you are too busy to serve and lay your life down for Jesus, you are not busy in a good, healthy way. There is probably some low-grade idolatry happening. Chad, I got too much on my plate. I can't put something else on. Fine. Clear room off your plate because Jesus needs to be a priority. Chad, I'm not good enough. Chad, I got some some real addiction, some real sin. I got some real darkness still in my life. I I can't serve. Serving is for the the good put together Christians. (laughs) That, that sentence shouldn't exist in English. A good put together Christian doesn't exist. The whole point of Christianity is that we stink and we need Jesus. That's the whole point of this message. The whole point of the gospel is that Jesus puts us back together. Listen, I'm a full believer in the proclamation of God's word. I fully believe that God moves powerfully when we teach the scriptures. But I also know there's a ceiling on how much my teaching and preaching can do in your life. You want to know what does wonders for your walk? when you stop just listening and you actually go do. So hear me, hear my heart on this. We are not just trying to fill spots here at Shelter Cove. In every church across the planet, there's always a need for help. But but our motivation is not to just get warm bodies in in places. We're not trying to guilt trip and, and emotionally manipulate you into this. What we're trying to do is disciple and grow you because we know that when you serve, you're most like Jesus because Jesus didn't come to be served, but he came to serve. And so we're not just trying to get bodies into positions and fill up holes. We want your growth. We want your discipleship. We want your maturity. And that's why we want to end with this because one of the best places you can serve is in the local church context. I'm going to invite Pastor Jeremy to come on up. While he's coming up, in the seat backs in front of you, there's some forms. And I want you to grab this form and look at it. I want you to grab this and take a look at the information. Because there's some important info on here that Pastor Jeremy is going to direct your attention to. Church, a couple things. First of all, that was an awesome message, wasn't it? About serving. Amen. Awesome, awesome message, Chad. Always love it when you teach. Second of all, uh, so many churches across the the country are really about learning the Word of God and listening to the Word of God. And, and here's how we want to be different. Here's how we have an impact. It's not just about listening. It's not just about learning. We want, we want to live out the Word of God. And here's how we're going to do that this weekend. You've taken these out. Go ahead and wave it up in the air if you've got it in your hand. All right? If the person next to you does not have it out, go ahead and grab it and give them a paper cut, okay? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't do that. But here's how we want to we live this out. It's amazing what happens when everybody in the body of Christ says, God, I believe that you want to use me. You can use me. God's given all of us a spiritual gift. And if we just say, God, here I am. I want to serve. I want to be a blessing to you. I want to be a blessing to others. That's how we have an impact. So we've got a bunch of different opportunities on this card, and we've been intentional about giving lots of opportunities. You've got a a blank for your name, your email, your cell phone number. Maybe you're here today, and you're like, I have no idea where to serve, what to do. I I just know that I'm a servant as a follower of Jesus Christ, and I want to get involved. I want to get plugged in. You fill out your information. We'll contact you this week, and we'll get you plugged into serving somewhere in, a, in an area that works really good for you. We've got areas of children, students. Why children and students? Why is that an emphasis here? Because we want to create disciples of Jesus at a young age. Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. 
Uh, they were a priority to Jesus. They're a priority to us. We want them to be walking with Christ as early as possible. We are unapologetic about that. We've got a lot of different other ministries. The bereavement team, when people pass away, we've got groups of people that come and serve and make meals and love on people that are hurting. We've got first impressions. Why is this important? Usher, greeter, parking lot. We want people to experience the love of Jesus before they hear about the love of Jesus. There are so many different opportunities. You can fill out this card. You can also text this number 353-8161 and do it digital, digitally, especially if you have horrible handwriting, all right? Uh, so you can fill that out um, on your phone. Again, we will contact you, but this, this is who we are. This is what we do. This is the part of our mission statement of uh, raising authentic followers of Jesus, authentic servants of Jesus serve. And, and so that's what we wanna do. So I wanna just give you a moment of silence and just listen to God and just our request is that you respond based upon what God's telling you right here and right now. So would you just take a moment to just pray over this and fill this card out right now. Church, would you join me as we close in prayer? Father, we wanna thank you for Jesus. Um, it, it, is, it is because of Jesus, Lord, that we're here. Um, it's because Jesus laid his life down for a ransom, God, that, that he gave his life up. There would be a harvest, Lord, of, of both Jew and Gentile. God, thank you for that. And my prayer now, God, is that you would help our hearts to lay our lives down. It's not enough to just know this concept, God. We, we have to begin working at this. And I pray, God, that you would remind our hearts, you would remind our minds, the more that we lay our lives down for you, the more life and the more joy that we will find. It will be very difficult at times, and it will be very challenging at times, but it will produce fruit, it will produce righteousness in us that nothing else can. And I pray for those, God, that are wondering where they might use their gifts here at Shelter Cove. Show them clearly where they could be a blessing here and they could put this into practice because those that lay their lives down for you will serve. They'll make their life about you and about others and ask for your help in that now, God. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord. When you spoke these words, you had us in mind. You knew that we would hear this today. And I pray these things in your wonderful name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.